Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our presentation for AI4 conference. Uh, we'll be talking about Consumer Loop and what we do um, with data of ratings and reviews at L'Oréal. So just to quickly present ourselves, uh, my name is Olesia. I'm a data scientist on the team, and I'll be presented together with Remy, who is uh, a senior data scientist on the team with me. Just um, to give you a little bit of background of why uh, we embarked on the Consumer Loop project at L'Oréal, uh, it's all about understanding our consumers. When we develop the products, we go through a lot of iteration process to understand what is the best product that, that we can create for a person. So we have panels that uh, we organize and we present them with a product to give their reviews. And the first, it might not be that positive, uh, but we iterate and the next version is better. Still not great, but we're moving somewhere uh, until finally we arrive to something that's beautiful and uh, accepted by the people, very highly rated, and it's ready to be launched into the market. And once it's launched, that's it. Uh, we'll lose the track of what is happening in the market. We don't know if people who have seen this product in uh, real life or purchased this across the world share the opinions of the people on the panel, except we do have that feedback. We just don't yet, before Consumer Loop, didn't yet use it to, to its full potential. We have all the things and reviews that people leave on retailers' website like Amazon. And... Um, that's what we use for Consumer Loop. We want to bring that feedback back. We want to understand what do consumers say about the product so we can iterate, cre create new, better products, have the panels again, launch them in the market, and uh, collect their feedback of the market again, and all of that on and on and on. But um, how do we do that? Yeah, so how can we do all this? Uh, we do have a lot of reviews, though, as we were mentioning. They could be from different uh, sources. Uh, they could also be from different shapes and, and length, um, speaking about many different things. And also, sometimes they could be also in uh, many kind of uh, new languages. For instance, here it's in Indonesian. Um, and it's really hard as a human to understand all those millions of reviews and and get what do they majorly speaking speak about. So I don't know if you noticed, but some of those reviews was were, were mentioning a lot of uh, dead bugs in our products. Um, so yeah, as a human, if with all that those information, it's hard to tell what is interesting out of it, but could be interesting for us to know that we have dead bugs in our products, for instance. So how can machine learning help us on understanding those feedbacks uh, in a more easy way? So the first challenge to do that is uh, to automatically understand the, the human reviews, the text of those reviews. So for that, let's take uh, a review. The mascara does not flake, but it dries too quickly. I prefer the old formula. Um, so we created three algorithms. The first one is the topic extraction. Um, basically, what it's going to do is, given any uh, some quotes, it's going to detect what they speak about. So here we can see mascara does not flake. It's speaking about the flaking topic. Dries too quickly, speaking about the product dryness topic. Uh, those topics were defined by the business. And then we have another algorithm, which is the topic enrichment. Um, this algorithm will detect if there is any new topic, for instance, like dead bugs coming out that was not identified by the business. So, for instance, here, the I prefer the old formula referred to a new topic called discontinued formula that we actually detected out of our own data that was not um, identified by the business in the beginning of the project. So now we have a topic enrichment with topic modeling models that can uh, help us detect new things going out of the, the reviews. And then when we have all those topics, what we want to know is do people speak about those topics in a positive way or a negative way? So for that, we have a third algorithm, which is our sentiment analysis uh, that we just say, uh, flaking, the mascara does not flake, it's pretty positive. Um, dries too quickly, it's rather negative, and I prefer the old formula, 
Um, so the model identified that as a positive sentiment, even though for us as L'Oréal might be not a, a good thing if people do prefer the old formula. Um, so let's zoom in uh, some of our algorithms. So the first one is the topic detection algorithm. Um, so it's a supervised model. We have a review and the first thing we do is we are going to split it into uh, what we call quotes. Um, so in order to do this, we just have a rule engine that if there is a comma, if there is some specific words like uh, and, but, or we know that the sequence that is going to follow might speak about something different. So we split our sentences to with those uh, markers. Um, and then we have a first keyword matching um, rule that comes in to for each quote tell us if it might be speaking about flaking or not, for instance, for that example, where we want to have or machine learning model predict if this review is, uh, if this quote speaking about flaking or not. And we do that because we do have a lot, a lot of reviews, but not much speaking about flaking, for instance. So to train an algorithms and to labelize the data, it could be really hard to find those positive examples. So what we did instead was to use this keyword matching to first have a glance if an idea of uh, if the, the quote is speaking about flaking or not to then train our uh, supervised uh, model. So yeah, our supervised model um, to validate or invalidate the keyword matching algorithm. So we have the keyword matching says, OK, I think it might be speaking about flaking because it matched this word or this one. And then the supervised model will, co will confirm it's a binary model if it's actually uh, flaking or not. Um, the second model that we are going to have a quick zoom is the sentiment analysis one. So again, we have a review and it's basically a, just like if you use any open source and available on GitHub uh, model for sentiment, uh, usually they are trained on um, on the TripAdvisor because you have the, the reviews and you have the rating. And the good news is that we also have that, but in more of the beauty context. So we thought about using our own sentiment model out of our own reviews. So that's what we did. We take a quote, we train our own uh, NLP model using uh, BERT, and then we try to predict the ranking, the ratings. So it's a regression uh, model. Um, and then once we have the rating, we can bucketize them and say, oh, if you're uh, if you are above, let's say uh, 0 0.30, it's going to be positive. In the middle, it's going to be neutral. And, and if it's too low, it's going to be negative. And that's how we know uh, if a review is rather uh, like here a positive one. And this way we have a model much more adapted to the beauty context uh, that is more helpful for uh, for our project. So um, that's some of their issues and how they were solved for um, dealing with human reviews and understanding that. Another challenge that we have is how do we know if products are same or not across multiple platforms? So as uh, we mentioned in the beginning, the reviews that we work with come from different websites and uh, we need to analyze them all together. So it wouldn't matter for us if the product is reviewed on Amazon, on Sephora, we want to treat all of these reviews as one uh, source of information uh, about the same product. And uh, there are many ways to show the same product. So here you can see how the same uh, Genifique serum from Lancome can be displayed on Amazon, Sephora and Tmall, which is a retailer in China. And this are just the differences in the images. There are also differences in title, not just because of the language, but also because there is a lot of variability and flexibility in what retailers can display on their own website. So we need to be able to match all of that and be able to detect uh, that it is the same product and it might there might be an easy solution of just using the barcode um, so use that as a unique identifier that you can find on every product but unfortunately for 70 percent of products we don't have these barcodes 
the data is not super clean and this specific field is often missing. So we had to find ways to rely on other sources, on sources of information to be able to connect the products together. So what we uh, used is their image and the title, and I'm going to talk you through how we did it. Uh, first, uh, I'm going to talk about the image. So it's uh, summarized here and then talk about the title, which is very similar. So when we tried to uh, solve the problem of matching images of the same product, we relied on similarity learning. So we use CME's networks. So these are neural networks that are based of two or more identical versions of this network. So here you can see their pink um, rectangles that represent a uh, model. And each of these models would be the same model, the same architecture with the same weights. So during backpropagation, when we update the model, it will update all the weights in uh, all of these replicas of the model. So when you do similarity learning, um, contrary to traditional categorization or image classification, you would need to pass several examples. Um, and the model at the same time will learn to bring um, same, um, same uh, images together, closer together, and different images further apart from each other. So that will be the vector space that we'll get at the end after the model is trained. So there are different ways to train uh, a similarity model. Uh, here we use triplet loss, and that um, required us to pass three images at the same time, an anchor, a positive, and a negative. So at the same time, the model will would learn to bring anchor and positive closer together and anchor negative further apart. And uh, yeah, that's one of the ways that we found more efficient than uh, using just two images at the same time. And once we have trained the weights and we have got their vectors, we compared them using the cosine similarity and chose the threshold that FIDA needs to be able to decide that beyond this threshold, um, products are similar and below are different. Um, and uh, another thing that's worth mentioning here is that we used semi-hard training. So um, when we passed examples, we made sure that the examples are not too easy for the model to understand. So um, we gave examples where positive and negative pictures were pretty close to each other. Otherwise, um, the model wouldn't learn as much as it could. We also uh, implemented all of this in TensorFlow. So if you ever want to try to do this, there are a lot of things that are already implemented in TensorFlow, including triplet loss. So there is um, not as much development that needs to be done on your side. You can also use TF records to prepare your data. Here, a key to data preparation is grouping um, similar images together. So for our specific use case, we have a lot of products and only few images per product. So this meant that if we randomly picked examples for training, um, we would most likely pick three very different products. Um, given how the data set is structured. Uh, we use TF records to save products from the same, um, save images of the same product in the one record. So this way, if we pass several records at a time, we were sure that um, one record will contain positive image. So we were set for this part of the model. Um, to give you an example, uh, an understanding of how the model performed, so um, this it's summarized in the slide. You'll see that the precision uh, that we chose was very high when we set the cosine similarity. We chose it so that the, it would be very precise. And this is because from this uh, point forward, we built a graph and uh, we needed to be it to be as clean as possible. And I'll explain more later. But uh, yeah, there's a reason why the precision here is so high. So therefore, precision of one, so absolutely correct uh, by Fine-tuning our model with triplet loss, we gained 0.1 points in recall. So we went from 0.6 from pre-trained ImageNet to 0.7, which was a good success. And um, relaxing this precision metric a little bit to 0.098, we got another jump of 0.16. So at the end, 
still very, being very conservative and precise at 0 0.98, we got 0 0.86 recall on our um, test set. So as I mentioned, we did the same um, approach with text. At the end, what we did was create a vector representation of an image and then um, compare them. You can do the same thing with text as you do with image where you take text and you have a vector representation of this text and um, you compare those vectors. So again, for, for the title, we passed an anchor positive example, which is a title of the same product and a negative example, a title of a different product. And uh, we train the model to um, represent these vectors so that vectors of the same are close and vectors of different are far apart. And for the model that we used here, it was a count vectorizer with trainable weights. So during the training, these are the weights that were adjusted to create appropriate vectors. Um, the results for this model was for precision of 0 0.98. The recall was 0 0.68, so slightly less than with images, um, but still we got a lot of information from this training. So once we got an output of our image similarity and title similarity models, we uh, connected them into a graph. So here each node is um, a product and the connection is one of the models saying that this is the same product. Once we got those, uh, the graph representation, we identified connected components. So each connected component would be a unique product in our um, representation. So here I hope that it's clear why we wanted to be very conservative with our precision. Any additional link that doesn't actually represent the same product would merge this different products together and we wanted to um, avoid any connected components that actually contain different products. We wanted to keep it as pure as possible given the approach. So that's why precision was so important, a uh, high precision. And just to bring us back to the consumer loop in general, uh, this is a few models that power the tool and it has been launched in February 2021. And since then, we've had more than 10 million reviews analyzed um, and all of that covering more than 8,000 products. The tool has been used by four departments across the organization from research and development to uh, brands themselves. And we've seen more than 400 users come to the platform and it's only the start. Uh, we hope to get more and more users as we, as we improve the tool and its algorithms. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us in this emails. Thank you. Thank you.